But traumatic brain injury is a little bit different. Basically, if you get a brain injury, you know, and you go to the best hospital here, Craig Hospital, and you spend six weeks, and they get you kind of walking, and they get you kind of maybe able to talk, and they discharge you. Have a nice life. Thanks. Thanks for all the insurance money. And then maybe you go to a rehab facility, and like Spalding, and you spend you know three months at Spalding, and at the end of that, you can feed yourself, and maybe talk, and maybe walk. Um, you know, my neighbor, um, at the end of all that, he still didn't have a whole lot of talking going on. And then you come back, and, and or you're in the VA, and you know they say, oh, well, you have a TBI. Well, let's put you on an antipsychotic. Because we know antipsychotics really help TBI because they control your behavior. Well, the reality is antipsychotics are bad for you if you have a TBI. They use a lot of benzodiazepines. And benzodiazepines are bad for you if you have a TBI. So they're really focused on the symptoms. Let's use an SSRI, let's use a benzo, let's use an antipsychotic. Now let's treat the brain injury. And this is the difference with what we're doing. We are treating the brain injury. And so what I'm going to explain is, how the heck do you do that? So what we're building on is clinical research that goes back 30 years. This goes back to some work in the Soviet Union, believe it or not. And using infrared light, very low power infrared light, looking at the fact that, gosh, it does stuff to cells. And if you use some light wavelength, it does good stuff. So this has actually been going on for a while. And Harvard, Mass General Harvard, has been looking at this for a number of years. The Uniform Services Hospital has been looking at this for a number of years. And um, University of Texas and some folks in Australia, et cetera. And so what we're showing is that near-infrared light, in particular wavelengths, can stimulate the mitochondria and turn on the brain's repair processes. And so far to date, 100% of our patients have seen improvement. Now, how does this actually work? So this is, okay, this is the science slide. So if I start to really bore you uh, with the science, then just raise your hand, okay? Now, the last time I did this talk, somebody threw a bottle of uh, omega-3 fatty acids at me, hit me in the arm. It was okay, it was just a super fish oil wound. <laughs> And that's the only joke I'll tell, Sam, I promise. <laughs> All right, so infrared light. The infrared light penetrates bone like a window. It goes right through it. But it's got to get to the skin and the scalp and all that tissue and all those tissue interfaces, so it's a tough journey. But once it gets to the mitochondria, mitochondria are the energy production organelles inside your cell. They produce, well, more energy. Cell energy is good. If you've got cells that are sort of limping along, all of a sudden they've got the energy to function. Also it increases oxygenation and may, may stimulate new capillaries and blood vessels to grow into the area, increasing the chance for oxygenation. It turns on early cell signaling pathways, and that changes things as well as early response genes. Now early response genes are really important. They get down to the DNA and they tell the DNA to do stuff, like turn on growth factors. So let's take a look at another slide. This is actually a slide from the Harvard group. And so they're showing here the infrared light coming in, and it reduces excitotoxicity. Okay, what's excitotoxicity? Well, it's neurons that are irritated are, are pumping out tons of glutamate, and glutamate in too big of a dose is actually poisonous, and it kills other neurons. So reducing excitotoxicity is a good thing. Apoptosis is a, a good fancy word for death. Inflammation, that's important in the brain. Increases synaptogenesis, what's that? It's increasing connections between neurons. And new dendrites are forming, which allow new connections to form. And new circuits are forming. And how does all that happen? Well, it happens because of these little guys right here, the neurotrophins, BDNF being the most important one. And BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor is the brain's intrinsic repair factor. It allows the brain to start to rebuild. Think about that for a second.
The brain can rebuild. Brain injury can't be fixed. Maybe not completely, but somewhat. And sometimes somewhat is a whole lot if it's a mild traumatic brain injury. Now there's one problem with this slide from Harvard, guys. All due respect to Harvard. Up here it says transcranial LLLT. Do you know what LLLT is? That's low level light therapy. Now, we're not just two guys who you know, fell off the apple truck and um, get choked up over veterans. Um, we're actually scientists. And as Dr. Marie said, a lot of our science has been self-funded. And this is just a bit of the science that's gone on. This is showing that PTSD and TBI can be differentiated in a veteran population using spec scans. You know what the accuracy is? 94%. Okay, that's pretty good. That's better than the pregnancy test. Functional neuroimaging is distinguished as PTSD in a large community data set. This was 10,000 subjects. Same data, same results. That's what got us in Discover Magazine. That was my work with some colleagues, uh, Daniel Lehman, Rob Charzel, uh, Cyrus Raji, several others. Clinical utility, this is a comprehensive review that spec scans can be used to diagnose TBI, unlike what your average neurologist or the veterans will claim, or, excuse me, the VA will claim. Here's our, our first paper on the treatment of brain injury with an emphasis on transcranial near-infrared light therapy. Ten subjects, everyone got better. Here is the data from our laboratory research that shows that penetration data. This study alone has been cited 70 times by other scientists in 18 months. This is an article, a review article with Harvard on the potential of this to work for depression. Hold it a second, Doc. Did you say depression? Well, I thought we took Prozac for depression. We waited around for six, eight weeks, and maybe if we were lucky, it worked. No, this is depression, and patients get better in six or less weeks. So this is kind of exciting. We'll talk about that next year. And this is a paper, uh, a review article on our work in infrared light. And where do we go from here? We need to replicate that study. You know, we've treated 50 odd patients, not blinded, okay? They come in, they expect to get treated. We don't know what happens if we get 50 people who come in and get placebo. We wave a red light over their head. And another 50 get laser, who gets better? So we need to do that study. And with that study, then we can talk to the VA, we can talk to the military, we can talk to the medical community, and we can get this out there. Now, what's the barrier? Uh, it's just $960,800. Um, that's about one half of what they spend every day on the freeway overpass on Arapahoe Road. Just saying. It's about, uh, you can get that much in 10 days if you didn't have to provide security to a building in New York City. <laughs> Nothing else to say about that. But we want to do 100 subjects, 40 controls, 60 active treatment, with a spec scan and neuropsych testing before and after with 20 treatments. And we're going to do it for 9 to 60,000. Now we talked to Harvard about doing this study. They said, sure, we'll do 40 subjects. That'll be $2 million, please. The reason is overhead. Okay? The university has to pay for their lights and whatever luxuries and their CEO and the chairman and the president and the hangers on. And all of that runs up the bill. So yeah, it's $2 million at Harvard because three-fourths of it go to indirect costs, <laughs> stuff unrelated to the actual science. And what we do, we don't take a salary, guys. <coughs> the overhead costs are, are zero. I pay the rent out of my own pocket. We're all about the science. We want this to happen. We want people to get better. 